so quiet. Okay, good, good day, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It is March 22nd. We have a great show today, but before we get started, let's ask our own John Sibley Butler for some music. Amarillo by morning, up from San Antonio. The only thing that I've got is what I've got on. When that sun is hot in that Texas sky, I'll be booking at the county fair. Amarillo by morning, Amarillo, I'll be there. Bravo, bravo. Good job, Johnny. Well done, mm -hmm. well done. Johnny, how are you, sir? I am doing fine. There's a lot of work going on. There's a lot of discussions going on. I'm getting invited to speak a lot, not only about the the bank in, from San Francisco, the, the, the uh, Silicon Valley Bank, but what it means and what does equity mean in banks. And i uh, been doing that and looking at the world. But more importantly, I'm a... Uh, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a wedge from the from the golf tournament that's going on on the PGA at, at the Austin uh, Country Club. And uh, right. got two former students playing in that. Uh, joint speakers playing there and, and other Longhorns are, are in town. And I think if you look at the, the economy, it looks pretty good. And, and now there's a settling, in, a settling in, if you will. It's almost a reality check of where we are. Um, if, if you look at what we're talking about today, uh, yeah, oil and gas, if you look at all the stuff that on, um, on, on, on clean energy, there, there's a lot of debate about that. And, and I'm looking at it, Texas, we're looking at where the money is going for support in, from Washington. Of course, Obama took m most of it from us in the, uh, when he was president, but we're looking more to where the funding is going for the, for the future of energy. And as you know better than me, there are lots of ideas about about energy, uh, what we can do with energy, all the new technologies with energy. And staring us in the face is the World War II that's going on in Europe. And again, it's almost becoming like, okay, it's almost becoming like a commercial now. You know, it, it comes on television so much, people do not really talk about it. They don't think about all of the replic rep replications that's, that's happening in the energy crisis that's gonna bring about. So other than that, I'm here in the great city of Austin, Texas. I would I would stop this and go walk on to the uh, match play PGA and watch them hit a few golf balls. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. Llewellyn King, how are you? I'm well, thank you. And uh, good to be with you as usual. Um, I'm glad to see that Johnny is uh, self-promoting with his normal skill. I hope he really does get the speaking engagement soon. Um, <laughs> I do. I just turned down one in Morocco. It was a great trip and I was ready to go, except they said, I said, how long do you want me to talk? And they said, 10 minutes. And I said, I can't clear my throat in 10 minutes. I'm not going all the way to Morocco to talk about the desert economy in 10 minutes. So I'm not going. The world is a little trouble. The banking system, we have not overcome the problem. Some strange things are happening. One of the unfortunate ones of which is we're going to see a consolidation of banks, which may make those at the moment more secure, but it increases the hazard for the nation because they really will be too big to fail uh, without tremendous consequences. Uh, banks, as, uh, as I think <laughs> I think it was Galbraith said, you know, are a bit of a, a bit of a Ponzi school scheme anyway. They take your money, lend it to somebody else, call the loan an asset, et cetera, which is all fine till you want your money back. And if a lot of other people want their money back at the same time, oops, which is what happened out in uh, the Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, more surprising to me has been the collapse of, of the Swiss bank, the second largest bank in Switzerland. This is an enormous thing. It's been taken over by its chief competitor. Uh, that is prima facie an immediate solution, but it's not a good one for banking. It's not a good one 
and it's not a very uh, for the future of banking in Switzerland, um, uh, where banking has traditionally been a very strong uh, part of their economy. Of course, they lost some of their glamour when they, they couldn't hide money as effectively as they had by international agreement. But um, <clears throat> Credit Suisse has failed, and that's an enormous uh, thing. Uh, we're going to see more failures here, I suspect, and it will terrorize the stock market. The stock market is jittery at the best of times, and it is subject to hysteria. Uh, and so we're in a very precarious financial situation, which we didn't expect. What astounds me is this afternoon, I believe, the Federal Reserve again increased the cost of credit to tame inflation. That is a very risky move at this time because it was the cost of credit that brought down um, SV Bank and, and um, may bring down others. Uh, in Europe, we have an ugly war getting no better. Uh, I was yesterday interviewed a brilliant young brave woman who goes in and out of uh, Ukraine delivering medical supplies and surplus medical equipment, part of a large organization that does that. They get surpluses from American hospitals, European hospitals elsewhere, and they channel them in where they're needed. What upset her most, and as a consequence of this interview, upset me was the rape of children. And she is the mother of two girls. When she was describing it, she broke down. She has two young girls safe in, in, in Slovakia, but nonetheless, uh, uh, very frightening to know that children, very young children are being raped by the Russian aggressors in Ukraine. And we are watching this as a kind of television show, a sort of drip feed, let's help them up, stay alive, but we're not actually giving them anything decisive because of our own concerns about a larger war. Another rather distressing fact has been China essentially making a vassal state of Russia, which eventually the Russians will come to regret, another short-term move. So the world is a troubled place and the US is not beyond that trouble. I'm not getting any. Andres. Let me let me let me give some color before I switch to our focus here. Um, so for those listening, um, th there are 4,100 banks in the United States as of September 30th of 2022. There may be you know there are a few fewer now with a few breaks, and all those banks are carrying roughly 25 trillion dollars in deposits. So. You know, it's really fascinating that, um, you know, there are more banks than electric utilities. Uh, and of course, a lot of those banks mission is to be regional banks to stimulate the growth of the commercial you know, sector, uh, buildings, you know, the housing, uh, you know, work, workplaces, hospitals, things like that. So that's sort of one of the formulas of how America is so successful in growth. Uh, but, you know, clearly, you know, it's interesting what's going on with the concentration of risk and uh, how people are dealing with that. And so we're seeing a, somewhat of a failure of the risk being concentrated in the case of Silicon Valley Bank by all the startups um, banking with them only. Um, and similarly with Signature Bank in New York and other places. So we'll see how that we'll see how that pans out. But, but you know, uh, the digital transformation is happening at an accelerated pace. And our guest today is in the bowels of how this digital transformation is being performed at the electric utility industry. Uh, and obviously he works for a company that is a giant in telecommunications with the Department of Defense and many other sectors. Um, and so we have today Rob Butts. Rob, how are you, sir? Awesome. How are you guys? Glad to be here. Appreciate the, yeah. uh, the invitation to come and join such a colorful group here. Yeah, absolutely. We, we would like to spend the hour talking to you, learning a bit about L3 Harris and specifically what you do and what you focus on, uh, and then dive into 
you know, this thing about digital transformations that are going on at utilities, at cities, at, um, you know, uh, buildings all over the nation, the transformation sector with EV charging and all that. So, so start by telling us a little bit about L3 uh, and what you do for them and, and work. Yeah, but... yeah a absolutely. Um, so L3 Harris, uh, the division that I worked in in L3 Harris is public safety and professional communications, which is part of the communications um, um, systems uh, group, which is one of three groups within um, L3 Harris. So L3 Harris, what, 2022, 17 plus billion dollars in revenue. Um, large, large company, um, works in the defense industry. Um, you know, a couple of different groups, the integrated missions group, the communication systems groups that I mentioned about, space and airborne, um, drones, uh, um, uh, GPS uh, satellite systems and those types of things. I mean, we cover a plethora of, of different uh, different environments. Um, mm -hmm. What you and I had talked about um, on the electric utility side is, is specific to our uh, PSPC organization. So we we actually do work in um, with utilities in some of the other areas, um, some of the uh, imagery, um, drone imagery, photography um, types of, of systems. Um, some pretty interesting things there where we can look at foliage and we can look at, you know, different, um, different areas of, of, of that type of system. But really right now, our, our big focus is in how do we converge narrowband and broadband um, in, in the electric utility side? It's not just electric utilities, it's also transit, it's public mm -hmm. safety, um, manufacturing. Um, it, it's basically all the big verticals that we work in. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, my background is on the utility side. I was, I was with Southern Company for 38 years, um, uh, left there in 2019, and then um, came over to L3 Harris, who actually was a friendly vendor that, uh, that we had worked with, um, and uh, excited to be here and excited to, uh, to talk about a, a few of the things that we're doing in the utility business. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah, I was I was reading about you and, and your business models and, and all the guests that we've had on here. And I've really, really uh, been after this for, for some time myself, is that when you talk about broadband and then we talk about the utilities and uh, the big question comes down in a regulated industry like this, you know, how do we get how do people get paid at the end of the day? Uh, what is the business model with the technology? What, what's happening at the edge of the grid? I think people have lots and lots of great ideas about utilities moving forward. And of course, it has a lot of technology on it. But we all know that the that the that the grid edge up to the up to the house and et cetera has has to be automated. So when you when you talk about integrating uh, broadband, my question is, what technologies do you need to really do that? Can it be done now? Is it off the shelf? Are people working on it to really do what you want, your vision? of the grid? Yeah, I, I would say that the answer is the pieces are available today. Um, whether the solutions are available today is maybe a, a different question, right? So the individual pieces are available. Um, if, if you take a look at the utopia of the electric utility business and the way that they utilize broadband, it's really more on a private LTE sideline, right? It, it's really that they, they want to have and they want to own and operate their own um, broadband network to, to mm -hmm. serve their, their needs. And, and, you know, and, and why? Well, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. Security is a big one. Um, you know, they're, they're, the, the cybersecurity threats that, that um, are all over the world are especially significant when you talk about the electric grid, because in essence, it's a, you know, it, it, it could be the Achilles heel for, for any, you know, any nation. Um, I think we've seen that in, in a couple of different areas, and, and we for sure seen it um, at L3 Harris as we do a lot of cyber secure networks all over the world. Um, we see it um, in, in, our, in our networks. We see that there's an emphasis on that, and we see that there's been you know, potential attacks that have, that have come after the communication side of the business. So security is a big deal. Um, the, the capability to have broadband where they want it, when they want it, is another big deal. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to cover the populated areas like commercial carriers covered. It's another thing to cover the, the, the utility right-of-ways, right? The, the, you know, the places out where, 
you know, you're in the middle of nowhere. People don't like, um, they, they don't necessarily like high voltage lines near their house. They like them out in the middle of nowhere, um, but they have to be serviced and they have to be serviced in a safe way. And they have to be, you know, there's, there's not only communication for control, but there's communication for maintenance and those types of things that, that has to be available. And, and electric utilities have a unique uh, need for those kind of communications, not just in populated areas where commercial customers provide it, but also in, you know, in, in rural areas. And really the third one is the resilience of the network um, from things like latency. Um, if, if you're going to try to uh, perform um, uh, switching and, and protection and you want your network to be able to respond from the time that the tree limb hits the wire until the time that the wire hits the ground, you got to have a pretty fast network. Um, you know, that, that, that's something that's very important to them. Um, the capability to have, you know, sub 20 millisecond latency, 15 millisecond latency is ex extremely difficult to accomplish on a commercial network. But more than that, it's extremely difficult to maintain a consistent low latency capability. Um, and then the pure resilience from a uptime. Um, you know, 99% uptime, that's a lot of downtime, to be honest. 1% per year is a lot of downtime. Uh, I know that people, commercial networks will tout that they're up all the time and they're touting that, you know, everything's fine. If, if you happen to be underneath the tower that's out, you're down 100%. So, you know, that's one of the things that the electric utilities are very cognizant of, um, that their, their, their networks have to be resilient, they have to be safe, and they have to be um, secured. One follow-up question. Let's add the, the rate player or the customer or the digital person, I like to say, in there. And I, I live in Austin, Texas, and uh, we had a big ice storm. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, can the consumers themselves help out? Because we want big trees, we want great foliage in our yards, we want the lights to be on all of the time. And Austin Energy constantly preaches that we should be able to trim trees. You go trim a tree and somebody comes out with a shotgun and say, get off of my property. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how have you seen in a, in a linear way the adoption of, of, of customers actually working with the utilities to make sure that, quote, the lights are always on? Yeah, I've been out of the utility, that side of the distribution transmission side of it for, for, for quite some time. I, yeah. I, I can tell you, you know, uh, anecdotally is, is really the only way I can speak to that, um, that I believe that as we, you know, people in Texas, I think, appreciate the electric grid a lot more than, you know, the, than they used to. Um, you know, it's a, it's a uh, and I shouldn't say it that way. They appreciate. You're right. You're right. Well, I didn't know what Ericon was. I thought it was something in the icebox. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> they they appreciate the the need for electricity. I think more when you don't have it than when you do have it. Right. That that you start as we as we get into the digital age. Bringing it back to one of the things we're talking about here is we get into the digital age. You realize that without electricity, you can't charge your smartphone. You can't charge your tablet. You're your laptop only works for a certain period of time. Your Wi-Fi router doesn't work without electricity. Um, you know, all those different things that, that go away, um, you, you lose focus of that when you don't have electricity. Um, to speak nothing of the fact that, yeah, maybe I have gas heat, but I have, to electric, I have an electric fan that pushes it around the house. And mm -hmm. so without electricity, you don't have that. And so sometimes when the hardship hits, you know, it, it, it tempers folks a little bit when the utility shows up to trim the trees, you know, along their, along the, uh, the utility lines. And so I, I know that, that, that the, the, um, the, the public treats the electric utilities very well when, when um, the electric utilities come in to restore service. I mean, they, they bend over backwards to help out the, the utility workers. These guys are working, you know, long hours in really bad conditions. Um, they may be away from their families because they may have, you know, provided, be providing mutual assistance from another utility somewhere across the country. And the, 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 um, the welcome that you get from the local citizens is amazing. Uh, they, 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 they bring you food, they bring you water, they, you know, they'll, they'll let you come into their house and get warm. They'll, they'll do all kinds of great things. And, and, you know, that, that, that I think is, 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 
turning the electric utility industry into not the big bad guy that goes to the public service commission, asks for a rate increase all the time and sends me a bill every month, but somebody that actually provides me something that's life-saving, you know, through a wire that comes into my house. Right. I agree. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions, but I'll start with an irrelevant one. Are you in Fall River? Uh, no, I'm in Atlanta. Ah, uh, I'm in Rhode Island and we drive through Fall River when we go out to Little Compton, which is our favorite place. Uh, so we know Fall River. Anyway, uh, to the subject, when you talk about broadband, do we have, is there adequate spectrum available? There's never adequate spectrum available for broadband. Um, it, I don't think anybody would ever say that we've got an abundance of spectrum. Um, in the, on the broadband side, um, excuse me, on the electric utility side, um, if you want to own and operate your own private LT network, there are not a lot of choices. Um, you, you know, you, you can, especially if you're trying to cover large areas um, and, and you need low latency and you need those types of things, you need low bandwidth, right? You need mid-band spectrum. You need something sub one gig. That's what you're really looking for. Um, Anterix has got some spectrum that they're, that they're, leasing slash selling um, very prominently here in the U.S. It's starting to take off. I shouldn't say prominent. It's available, but it's not widely used yet. It's being adopted um, actually rather quickly in 2022. Bless you, Andres. Um, but you. it is, um, you know, it, it is something that's a big investment for utility. Uh, Spectrum is extremely expensive, whether you lease it, whether you buy it. I don't care how you get it, trade it, whatever. It, it is very expensive. It is the gas that runs the car um, and, and you have to have it. Um, there is CBRS spectrum that's available, especially if you're in, you know, you're away from the coast um, where the Navy has jurisdiction over it. Um, you, there, there's a lot of spectrum available there and there's some high bandwidth spectrum that's available, um, but it's not as useful in, in large, vast areas as the, as the mid-band spectrum is. Um, um, if you're not using broadband, is there another way of protecting your own telecommunications or segregating them so that they're not vulnerable to national failures? Are you talking about on the, on the commercial carrier systems? That's correct. So FirstNet offers utilities um, secondary um, uh, priority capabilities. So they call it enhanced primary. Um, and, and we have had utilities that have, that have um, we have worked, FirstNet's one of our, one of our Mission Critical Alliance partners. Um, and we have had folks that um, have used FirstNet for their, um, for their broadband needs. Um, th these are generally folks that potentially are not IOUs, so they really don't have the capital to go invest in a private LTE network, but do understand that they need priority access to the network. So there are opportunities in some places, um, well, to, to gain that priority access. Uh, the FirstNet network has got a lot of spectrum. I mean, band 14 is a 10 by 10. That's a huge amount of spectrum. Um, Southern Company is on a three by three um, uh, spectrum. They've got you know, a little over seven megahertz of spectrum that they deal with. Um, you don't need a lot of spectrum in, in, you don't need a 10 by 10. Everybody wants more. It, you know, your broadband speeds are faster, but the things that I talked about don't require fast, you know, that don't require a lot of throughput. Um, that's when you get into things like video camera capability, 4k camera capability, um, you know, if you're going to service rural broadband, sometimes you want to have additional capabilities. But when you're talking about low latency things and you're talking about mission critical push to talk, if you want to go to the voice side of that business, if you're talking about um, protection and line devices and those types of things, it's a it's they're small data bits. They're not big. They're not big payloads. And so you can get away with um, with having smaller spectrum. We're, uh, I've been looking into DER and I'm doing a conference, a um, virtual conference next week with the US Energy Association on distributed energy resources mm -hmm. leading to uh, uh, virtual power plants. And that depends tremendously on communications. Absolutely. Very good, reliable communications between all these 
sources, small sources of generation or of economy? Um, do we have enough communications capacity to bring about a virtual power plant? Good question. Um, I would say that utilities across the country that have invested in, in private LTE networks absolutely have a have a they they have a foothold into into being able to do that. Um, they have the backbone to be able to deal with DERS, and they 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 are they're ready to go, and 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 in some instances have already headed in that direction and are, are and have been very successful with it. Um, they you know the the some of the there, there's power coming in and power going out in the in the commercial world, right? I mean, you see the EV charging stations all over the place. Um, the power companies are more than happy to sell retail to, to 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 a customer, you know, on a remote EV charging station. But there's got to be billing and there's got to be the capacity to be able to turn it on and off and be able to monitor it and figure out how to deal with it. And 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 you've got a lot of them. Uh, you know, there 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 are a lot of those things. So, you know, those types of, of endpoints, if you will, numerous endpoints um, are, are important. Metering is important. Um, distributed energy is extremely important um, to, the, to the electric utility grid, but more importantly to supplementing the grid is protection from the, from the uh, distributed energy to the mm -hmm. grid, right? So, mm -hmm. you, you mean, distributed energy is wonderful if it works right, but you can't have you know, somebody pumping energy, electricity into a, a feeder that, you know, is supposedly isolated for, for work and have somebody energize that. That's a safety issue. Um, mm -hmm. it, that's one thing utilities do not compromise, and that is safety. There, there is no compromise on safety, whether it's public safety or for their own employees. They will, they will bend over backwards to make sure that safety is paramount in anything they do. So, so a part of this communications requirement is to move data very quickly because DER depends on data and the analysis of the data so you know what you're getting and how to react instantly to it. Um, do we have the capacity to move the data for DER to work effectively? Yeah, again, again, that data that you're moving is not a large amount of data. It, it is, it's small, it's small updates, right? but it's got to be fast and reliable. Um, again, the latency is a big deal. Um, the capacity is important because you don't want to have things stepping on top of each other. You know, you've got to prioritize your data. Um, you, you have to make sure that, you know, things that are not quite as important. Metering is not as quite as important as, you know, protection to the grid. Um, you know, you can, you, if you want to read the meter, I can read it today or I can read it tomorrow. I'm still going to get the same reading. I'm, I'm not the same reading, but I'm still going to get a good reading. But if, if, if I need to protect the grid from somebody pumping energy in from a distributed energy resource, I need to do it now and it needs to be reliable and it needs to be efficient. So I think that, like I said, it's, it's what's pushing a lot of utilities into the private LTE sector um, is, is the ability for them to be able to control their destiny when it comes to next generation uh, grid modernization is the best way to put it. So Rob, real quick, let me jump in here. Um, Rob, explain, walk us through a little bit. There, when we talk communications for the audience, there are two things going on, right? You got voice communications. People are on the field doing work, talking to each other. Traditionally, historically, that has always been on a land mobile radio, a push to talk type of radio. And now we're all using iPhones and stuff. And you have the the, the potential of having a private LTE. So when you're talking about integrating these things and, and me perhaps having a, an augmented reality or you know virtual reality goggle and looking at the equipment, talk a little bit about what, what Harris is envisioning. And you show me a device that was amazing with new chips and all this stuff. Talk a little bit about that and where things are going. Absolutely, I'd love to. That's that's our bread and butter right there. Um, on the on the on the um, voice side, I mean, there's really two ways to handle voice, right? You can handle it narrowband, which is the P25 standard that you know that that we deploy or that we um, that we sell. Um, one of the you know one of the world leaders in in P25 development as well as 
um, you know, uh, uh, deployment of those types of systems. Um, we've got three of the top five utilities in the country use uh, L3 Harris P25 radios. Um, they, they are reliable, um, they're mission critical, right? I mean, and that is the key, they, they're mission critical. And mission critical is not a buzz phrase for us. Mission critical is a standard that we, that we deploy. Um, our customers, uh, de you know, they, they demand guaranteed coverage. Um, you know, they demand um, uh, uptime. Uh, they, they demand that those devices are, you know, work when they need to work. Um, and P25 is the most reliable technology for voice. There's no doubt about it. Police, fire, EMS, utilities, mm -hmm. transit, we, they all use it and we'll, we'll continue to use it. Um, but you did ask an interesting question, and that is, can you use broadband for mission critical voice? Mm -hmm. So that, that question came up years ago. Um, there have been a lot of uh, uh, companies that have, you know, to be quite frank, very successfully deployed push to talk over broadband, pop, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, you know, Zello, ES Chat, um, you know, some of the, some of, some of the, uh, the ones that have been more successful. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they have deployed those, those products. But generally, and not across the board, but generally those products are not integrated into the network, right? They're, they mm -hmm. run over the top of the network. In some mm -hmm. instances, some of them have been in the past or they have sort of touched on integration into the network. But in release 13, release 12, 13, 2016, 2017, um, 3GPP, mm -hmm. the, the standards body over LTE, realized that um, you know, voice or mission critical voice, not you know, um, IMS, not phone calls mm -hmm. and text messaging, all those things, but mission critical voice was, was something that the LTE networks needed to address. Um, and so they, uh, the, the plenums got together, the really smart people got together, took the P25 standards, took some of the Tetra standards from Europe and, and those types of things and, and melded them together and came up with the MCPTT or what they really called MCX, which is push to talk um, voice as well as data, as well as mm -hmm. video, right? So, so all the different platforms and put them into a, a set of standards and adopted those standards, I think, and released uh, 13. And mm -hmm. since then, the care, um, the vendors have been building to those standards. And some of those standards, um, well, those standards allow, you know, specific KPIs for, you know, uh, voice to, to like, like uh, you know, PTT to voice um, latency, how long it takes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the KPIs, there's three KPIs. Um, it also started looking at the different features. What features have to be provided? What are, the, what, are the, what are the paramount features that have to be provided? And then how does it interconnect with the network? How do you deal with priority? How do you deal with the capability to be able to deliver uh, group calls, right? With, without, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to, over a large group. I mean, if you've got a utility and they have a muster area, let's just say at a Walmart, because there's a hurricane going on and they've got, you know, 3000 bucket trucks with the associated three guys per bucket truck, you know, 20,000 people sitting there and you've got to hit the PTT button and they're all in the same group. You're going to stress out an LTE site if you try to hit single calls to every single one, right? Yep, Multicast yep. is the way to do it. That's a technology that, that has been used on the, in the video world, but has been adapted to the mission critical voice world. So those types of things, the, the QCIs, the capability to be able to get priority on the network um, mm -hmm. and, you know, being able to have the, you know, the arc level set correctly and all those types of things, those pieces are part of the LTE network. That's something that PTT over cellular really doesn't deal with at all, right? Mm -hmm. That makes it part of the network, which gets it more in tune with the way that P25 runs over the LMR networks. Right. Um, then you have to look at the reliability of the network, right? P25 networks are built for 99.99% or 99.9%, um, you know, availability. They, you know, they have the hardened towers and, and you know, those mm -hmm. types of things. I mean, it, it, it is a big undertaking to get those types, to get those types of, um, of availability. But the key is, is that if you've got 
LTE, you've got a lot more towers because P25 has the capability to be able to blast a lot further and on, you know, in a, out of a single tower. So it, there's a lot to building the networks. I think that LMR will be around for the foreseeable future for a while. Um, you know, put a number on it. I, I'm saying 10 years, whatever. It's not happening tomorrow. Um, as MCPTT starts to develop in their feature sets, as they start to become more prevalent across some of these networks, um, I think you'll see some of the lower hanging fruit probably drop first. Some of the Tetra networks, maybe DMR networks um, will probably drop, you know, into the MCPTT world first. And I think that you'll see some hybrid networks where they take um, P25 and MCPTT and run them, you know, simultaneously over, over, over different areas and, and basically use gateways to, to, to link them together. So I, I think that the, the world according to Rob or the world according to Elter Harris is we need to take a look and keep an eye on this technology. We need to participate in the standards bodies to make sure that we understand what's going on. We support our customers as they take a look at these types of things. We're, mm -hmm. we're right. We've got a nice, uh, nice radio that, that actually supports MCPTT in this, in this particular radio. So converged radio with an LTE modem on the back, you know, on, built into it as well as full P25 trunk and conventional capability. Um, it, it's very important to, to our utility. Yeah. So Rob, what you're Gentlemen. saying, is, Rob, what you're saying is, as we discuss the technology, you're also saying that you you are at the very, very center of commerce in America in the future. So just think about in the 1950s when they were doing the, the highways, as we like to say on this program. So the job creation, company creation, the wealth creation, the, main, the maintenance of jobs now depends on what you're doing. As a matter of fact, Andre would say, you, we're gonna put you at the very, very center of commerce in the future. So mm -hmm. in that connection, when you look at the consciousness, if you will, of America, and we talk about economic development, very seldom do we utilize and talk about these kinds of technologies. We talk about bringing companies here, we talk about creating companies. Speak some about the world of Rob, the world of Rob, and how you think that broadband is the new highway function for America, whether it was rural or whether it's urban. That's an interesting question. Um, I I would say that probably on the broadband side right now, um, we're in that area in broadband. And, and, and I remember a long time ago, far, far away when I was a young child, and my grandfather said that I was on Interstate 81, and what did the 81 mean? He said, that's how fast you can go. Um, the, there, there weren't that many interstates, right? They, they only connected the big cities. Um, you, did, you didn't have interstates in, in any of the rural areas. Um, you really didn't even have the interstates that that surround the big urban areas today and that and that fork out into the, you know, into the this, let's call them suburban areas. Um, right. And, you know, the, the, the folks that were fortunate enough to be between the, the big urban cities got to take advantage of the of the highways, mm -hmm. but they didn't necessarily they, they weren't part of their life. Right. Uh, people drove by them. Um, you know, it, you know, what it, what, what was the. Uh, the, the Buddy Holly and the and the and the the road that that um, you know that everybody surpassed um, you know all of a sudden you know these these rural highways that were the lifeblood of these communities an interstate comes in and it sort of blows right by them. Well, I look at the, at the broadband industry today as we are we built out the major super highways, right? Um, you know, unfortunately, we built them with, um, with gravel the first time that didn't work very well. Then we, then we added asphalt <laughs> and now we're going to do some in concrete. So I, I think that they're getting better. Uh, they're more resilient. Uh, they can handle higher speeds. We've added lanes to them. Um, you know, we, we built out, um, you know, uh, uh, the loop highways around the big cities. Atlanta's got one, um, you know, Charlotte's got one, DC's got one, they've all, you know, all the big cities have them. And we're starting to build these spurs out into the, you know, future populated areas um, that, 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 that are being able to be covered. Um, but we still haven't built it out. We haven't built interstates between, um, you know, the, the rural cities. And, and, and we may not, 
Um, but you may mm -hmm. get a county that decides that they want to build a really nice road between two of their smaller cities. And mm -hmm. I, I can that to private LTE, right? I mean, they see a real need. They, you know, they've, they've got an industry in one city and they got a supplier in another city. They see a real need to build a high speed highway between the two of them because it's good for commerce. It helps their safety. You know, those types of things to me, that's where it makes sense. And I think on the broadband side, you'll continue to see the build out of those spurs. You'll, consider, you'll continue to see specialized highways, i.e. FirstNet, um, mm -hmm. that, that are being built, but they're still, still being built you know, for, the, for the higher urban areas. I think that the specialized areas or the rural areas of the, of the highway system, I think it, it takes a special group of people to make a conscious decision financially and, um, and you know, to, to build those types of things out. So it's sort of an analogy, mm -hmm. but best one I could come up with. I right. think it's very, very good because people, people, people are now moving to the rural areas too. So I think it's, you have those kind of people to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Rob, I wanted to ask you about Southern Link. Uh, what do we learn from it? Does it extend to all the operating companies in the Southern system? And uh, are they pleased with the, what they've learned? So I, I have a special allegiance for Southern Link. I worked there for 17 years. I, I know um, that, which is why I'm asking you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Llewellyn. Uh, um, yeah, they're, they're still near and dear to my heart, believe me. Um, we, we ran an IDEN network for years. Um, we covered 128,000 square miles of, of, the, uh, of the Southern Territory in Alabama, Georgia, Southeastern Mississippi, and at that time, uh, the Gulf Coast of Florida, part of the Gulf Coast of Florida, um, very successfully built that up to you know, close to 300,000 customers. And, and really, you know, it was a rock solid network. Um, it worked very well, um, but it lacked broadband. And our customers were looking for broadband, you know, the, the, the advent of Blackberries and the advent of, although mm -hmm. we did have a Blackberry on the Iden network, but the advent of, of smartphones and those types of things that the Iden network just wasn't designed for that, right? It just wasn't, it, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was a voice first network. Um, it supported text, it supported phone calls, but it was a PTT voice first network. Um, Southern Company realized that not only on the voice side, but on the, uh, you know, uh, grid of the future side of the, of the business, that they really needed to build a private, their own private broadband network to, to really pull all the different technologies, all the different systems that, that, they, that we had um, they were they were going end of life, and we had to make a decision: Do we want to invest in another proprietary system to run this group? You know, to run right. in this area. You know, do we want right. to do whatever another mesh system over here? Do we really want to do that? And and Southern Company made the decision, I believe, in 2016, 2017 timeframe, um, that no, we we need to have a single coherent broadband strategy across our entire footprint. And mm -hmm. they already had the spectrum because of the IDEN network. They just had to refarm it into band 26, which fortunately we're, we're, we're able to do. And they started building out the, uh, the private LTE network. Um, they now have approximately 1300 towers, I believe it is, um, in Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi. Um, they no longer have the, the, uh, the, the subsidiary in um, around the, Headquartered out of the Pensacola area, Gulf Power. They sold that to Nextera, but um, you know they they have those they have those uh, assets in place. Um, they're running, you know, I don't know the number, and I I would rather not guess um, because I'm sure some of them will be watching this at some point, and I'm I'm probably mm -hmm. going to guess high. So, but it's I, I think it's you know twenty plus thousand. Let's just say that um, routers on their network today. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they have they have uh, in the tens of thousands of, uh, of PTT users using mission critical push to talk today. Mm -hmm. um, they, that, and, and that's basically mostly on the uh, on the operating system side. Rob, um, they, Rob, real, real quick, how much, mm -hmm. what was the count of how many network engineers that you remember in Southern Link? How many network engineers? Network as far as LTE network engineers? All, all network engineers, all the talent running the thing. Oh, wow. 
Um, I know being on the management side of it, we tried to put together a, um, an org chart to, to figure out, okay, we're going to build, well, first of all, we had to learn how to spell LTE. All right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we were Iden guys. Now we, we, <coughs> you know, we, we knew a lot about telecom and, and, you know, we were pretty, pretty smart guys. We we're pretty proud of ourselves for how well we ran the Iden network. Mm -hmm. But when the time came to build an LTE network, we were a little out of our league. Mm -hmm. um, we, we uh, probably underestimated the manpower by three X. Um, mm. and, and it was specialized manpower. That was the big thing. You had to mm. have folks there. There are not a lot of, you know, IMS engineers floating around in the, in the hemisphere, <laughs> you know, with their, with, with their resumes out on boards looking for jobs. I mean, they just right. don't exist. Mm -hmm. Um, they're, they're expensive. They're hard to get. Um, and, and when you get them, boy, you, you, you really love on them because they, they make your life a lot better. Um, it was a, it was a huge push for us to do a build out of 1300 towers or 1300 sites. We didn't build 1300 towers. We, mm -hmm. we reused some towers, but you know, that, that was a, that was a big deal. That, that was a lot more than we had. I think we had 800 plus towers in, mm -hmm. um, in the Iden world. So, you know, you're talking about a 50% increase, right? Um, and, and we did all that in, in basically three to four years. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was a monumentous task, an undertaking that, that we did. Um, you asked the question, are they happy with it? I think they're very happy with it. Um, I, I think other utilities are very jealous of them. Um, and, and I say jealous in a good way, because I think Southern took a leap of faith um, that, that this was the right way to do it. Got a lot of smart people at Southern Company. And they did a lot of analysis. Do we, you know, do we lease or do we buy? Do we, you know, do we, do we utilize the commercial carriers with all the promises of priority and all those types of things? Or do we, you know, go it alone on our own? And, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that, that they know now they made the right decision. Hmm. To follow up with the uh, last question, which is, what is the impact in the utility world of 5G? So 5G has a lot of interesting impacts. Um, 5G is not what you are going to be using in the rural areas, obviously. Um, I, I, and, I, and I'm assuming you're talking about um, millimeter wave type 5G, right? You're talking about the, the, the real 5G, not the marketing 5G. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, you know, when, when you talk about that, there's some really, really good uses for it in the utility world. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. Um, one of the examples is when you build a power plant, there are a lot of sensors. It's just like in manufacturing facility, right? There's a ton of sensors, especially if you do a lot of robotics. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sensors in a, in a power plant. I grew up in power plants. That's where I started. Um, you know, I remember working in digital data systems where we had, you know, five, 6,000 analog inputs um, digital inputs, you know, temperatures and pressures and, and those types of things, um, that those are all wired. Every one of them are wired and they're all wired back to the control room or they're wired to some control room. Um, in the, in the 4G LT world, I wouldn't say there's a limit. There's a monetary limit to how many endpoints you want to hang on to a single site, you know, B. Um, and, you know, there, there's also the throughput at the, you know, at the, at the bottom there to, to get all those in. There was some recognition within the plenums at 3GPP that, that if you're going to move the, into the 5G world where you, you know, you're going to get higher bandwidth, there's got to be more than just higher bandwidth. And one of the things they did was they made the standard that you have to be able to support a million endpoints on a single ENOB. And so, you know, that significantly changed how you you can deploy broadband so if you think about it utopia you could you could deploy one site at a power plant and have wireless sensors in every single piece of that plant and run no wires all right um same thing with a with you know with a manufacturing facility um get out of the utility world and go to you know a neighborhood you know, you, you could do the same thing. You put up a 5G tower, you can connect every single house wirelessly. Um, you know, an office building, you know, forget running the Cat5 cables and forget running the fiber all over the place and forget all those, you know, Wi-Fi hotspot, you know, endpoints and all the connectivity that goes on. You don't have to do that anymore. 
you, you have the capability to be able to do it from a single site. Now, with a single site, it comes a single site of point of failure. So you have to be very careful when you go that direction that you don't end up shooting yourself in the foot. But mm -hmm. there are there are capabilities to be able to you know to, to mitigate that. Yeah, right. Rob, we, Rob, we say that all things in the business world starts with demography, <laughs> and and we look at shifts in demography. Uh, you know whether you're doing a service station on on a highway and, and you put a sense out there to see how many cars go by, and what we do know is that if we look at the demographics in America, there's a lot of shifting going on. Mm -hmm. uh, that is what 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 was rural at one time is now urban, which was urban at one time is now rural. Mm -hmm. My question is when you when you trace the data on that uh, and you and you automate the kind of uh, services that people will have, have you have you looked at any trends on the relationship between demography and the movement of people and where we're going in the future? That's that where power plants will need to be because in our discussion, rural is not a it's not it's not stationary. And not this urban. And in oh, yeah. Texas here, there's a great article on that I love on on how some how the wealth are moving and revitalizing small cities. We have great small cities that uh, that people developed in the 1920s and 1930s. So have you given any notion? I would like to know the demography, if you will, of the technology when you so, plan and how you think about that. So yeah, and I'm I'm excited to answer. Can you tell? Um, so. I think that, of course, we'll call it BC, right? Before COVID. Um, I, I think that mm -hmm. there was more of a centralized, if you will, um, almost, you brought up a good point, and that is the downtown areas are becoming rural areas, right? In, in a lot of the downtown business areas, sometimes in, in some cities are becoming rural areas. I right. think that was happening before COVID, right? It, it was starting yeah. to happen where, you know, folks were looking at, um, you know, office campuses that were, you know, away from the urban, you know, the, the center of town in, in big cities. I know in Atlanta, that's the way it is. You know, um, you, you know, everybody got tired of commuting downtown, right? Mm -hmm. uh, our mass transit is not the greatest in the world here. And, you know, it, it just became how many, you know, we can't continue to add lanes to the highway so everybody can get back and forth an hour drive. And mm -hmm. they started moving some of these office parks out to closer where, you know, where people lived. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, quality of life was better. I don't have to sit in traffic for two hours every day. Um, and, and it made sense. Well, after COVID, I think what we're seeing is that people are moving, they're dispersing even more, right? Especially the younger generation, not me, mm -hmm. but the younger generation is, is sort of dispersing even more. And, and we've had the, cap we've, we've developed the capability because of broadband, We've decayed, you know, not necessarily wireless broadband, although some, some of it's wireless broadband, but just broadband in general, we've developed the capability to be able to disperse the workforce. Now, I would argue that there is something lost there with the interact with the human interaction, right? I mean, I really enjoy interacting with you guys here, the four boxes, but you know, to be honest, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd much rather do it, you know. At a, at a table over a couple of beers, it would be, it would be much better. I mean, but I think that, you know, as we, as we disperse our workforce um, into some of these smaller towns, John, that you had mentioned, I think the quality of the small towns gets better. Um, I think people take, a, they're, they're more engaged and they're more um, bought into their community. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that their, their, their work, um, Play life is is different. It, it 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 tends to be a little bit more laid back for them. Um, I, I think people get back to the you know the older ways of of the way we used to do business. Um, small town America, you know, um, they were they were islands among themselves, right? They were an economic island among among itself. You had you know they could they could live without the the capability or out the connection to to the to the urban world. Mm -hmm. I think broadband helps us sort of get back to that that time and, and that that camaraderie that people are having in some of these small towns because they can still stay connected to you know the global economy if we if you want to use a buzz term they can still stay connected to the important things in their life that you know that they, that they were used to when they lived in the urban areas they can still stay connected to those types of things but they don't necessarily have to be 
physically located in those areas to still stay connected. So I think that the broadband side of the world helps in that. Um, I think it hinders it too, right? It makes it too easy not to have to go into the office. It makes it too easy to hide behind the screen um, where you don't get to human interaction sometimes. And I think that they're, they're down, they're, they're pitfalls to that side of it. Okay, thank you very much. So Rob, real quick, uh, tell us uh, as we're closing with you here, what's in front of you the next six months? What's going on? Any new products, any new announcements, any new customers? What can you share? So I can tell you that we announced last year that we're putting an MCPTT client into our converged devices, converged radios. Andres, mm -hmm. you and I talked about that some. Yep. Um, we will be um, we will be rolling that out um, next month mm -hmm. um, to a customer. Um, very excited about that. Um, we we also have uh, additional customers that are that are going to be rolling that out this year. Um, in July and then probably in September. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what they really like about the product is that not only do they have the capability to be able to use broadband for MCPTT in that product, but they can also use conventional P25 as well as P25 can trunk, trunking all in the same product in their portables and mobiles. So we're mm -hmm. very excited about that side of it. Um, mm -hmm. We continue to push the envelope when it comes to uh, P25, right? Um, our connectivity with our mission critical alliance through our partners like Samsung and like FirstNet and like uh, MCM Tech and uh, Exacom and uh, Dracontis and all the different products that we, you know, that, that all the different partners that we that we work with really is, is, is pushing us more towards solutions based um, enablement of our customers. So, you know, rather than having a product looking for a home, we've got a solution looking for a problem. And I think that the, the, that focus has really resonated with our customers and, and they rely on us as their mission critical provider for, mm -hmm. you know, voice uh, narrowband and, you know, broadband capabilities. So we'll continue to go down that route. Um, L3 Harris as a company will continue to support, you know, all of our verticals, whether it be the federal, the DOD, utilities, transit, you know, all the different all the different verticals as we, you know, continue with our majority of the engin engineer company, um, you know, pushing the envelope as, as, as we move forward. Exciting yeah, times I, right I, now. Yeah, as I told you, and congratulations on everything that you're doing and pushing the envelope and being on top of all the standards and driving the technology transformation, which is really the challenge, adoption. But, uh, you know, I tell everybody, if you want to help the utility transform, you get to start with the voice network that is already in place. You cannot ignore it. Uh, you have to realize that the safety and, and the delivery of service and support and storm management is mission critical and the humans that do it need to communicate. So you can just not ignore that and go straight to data for machines talking to machines. So it's an interesting conundrum and it's an interesting challenge of how you make that happen. Uh, you know, affordably, affordably is the key word, uh, and then reliably in mission critical standard levels, right? So, so yeah, absolutely, and, and and let customers migrate if they want to migrate, right? There has to be a migration. You can't just rip and replace. I mean, right. you can't leave customers stranded. It, it, there, there has to be a migration, and you know, if if the customer decides that's the direction they want to go, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Rob, thank you for being with us today. I don't know, parting thoughts, guys. I thought it was I think very interesting and uh, filled in a lot of holes in my knowledge base. So thank you very much, Rob. Awesome. Rob, you're doing great things and you're at the very, very center of our future for jobs and, and opportunities. That's always shifting with new technologies. Absolutely. Guys, thank you so much for letting me join the uh, the party here. Uh, great questions and 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 uh, and great input from you guys. So thank you. Absolutely. We'll, we'll circle back with you about our Digital 360 Summit, Rob, and many other things. John, take us away. Oh, yeah. Much as I hate it. Georgia. Oh, my sweet Georgia. Thank you, John. The whole day through. It's an old sweet song. Keeps Georgia on my mind. You tell those Georgia Woo! Bulldogs they've been lucky because they didn't play my LSU Tigers, my alma mater, in the regular season. 
Bring right. them on, John. Bring and them you on. You let them know that that we beat them in the last quarter. Thirty to nothing. On. What an embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, take Thank care. You. Bye, bye. Okay, Andreas, I'm writing. I'm writing. I'm writing a, a letter to uh, to, to LSU, and I send it to you, and then you can approve it.